Tell me slow, but it just dawned on me that Lawrence Fishburne is in both the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the DC Cinematic Universe. Granted, he's not the first or only actor to cross over from Marvel movie to DC movie or vice versa, but he's in two different yet currently ongoing rival cinematic universes. It's kind of interesting. Ant-Man and the Wasp. So Ant-Man and the Wasp is the sequel to Ant-Man and the newest movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In this one, Scott Lang becomes Ant-Man again and Evangeline Lilly has become the Wasp. And they team up because a new situation needs fixing and an old situation needs fixing. A lot of things happen in this movie. It requires their attention. I just love Paul Rudd as Ant-Man, you know? Paul Rudd just oozes relatable and flawed character you want to root for. He's the underdog. He's a true underdog. In fact, this movie just screams underdog. I don't know why, but when I think superhero, Evangeline Lilly wasn't the name that came to mind. It was when she was in Lost, but Lost was over years ago. And she's back as a superhero, but Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly today just they don't scream superhero to me, which is why they're perfect. Underdog story. And the movie, generally speaking, is really enjoyable. The action sequences are top notch too, and the Ant-Man movies have the advantageous position to have their action scenes involve characters that are normal size, like you and me, then they go down to insect size, and that changes the scenario. Then back to normal size, and bounces back and forth like that. The way the movie plays off that, bounces off that, integrates these two worlds of different size, that's a specifically Ant-Man scenario for an Ant-Man film. In a world where superhero movies are everywhere, you have to play up the thing that makes your superhero movie unique. And the Ant-Man movies play that unique quality up well. And the action scenes involve the villain Ghost, who is someone who has been affected by the quantum realm. So she's facing in and out of our realm. She can go through walls and matter. It's pretty much Raziel's ability from Legacy of Kane. She just can't control it. The Legacy of Kane didn't really involve the quantum realm. In fact, the quantum realm, which we saw Scott Lang go to in the first Ant-Man movie, is a big part of this one. In that, I wish they would have delved into the quantum realm more. Feels like this is an opportunity to really explore what is it and break it down for the people at home. I mean, they break it down a bit, but they don't really, they don't go any deeper. It's a missed teaching opportunity as far as I see it. But really, Ant-Man and the Wasp suffers from what most Marvel Cinematic Universe movies suffer from. Which it has humor, which in and of itself is not a problem, but it has humor that sometimes compromises the more sentimental moments. And two, weak villain. There are exceptions. I'm not saying it happens all the time. Thanos was awesome. But really, if I had to put my money on it, those two flaws are the flaws that are in a lot of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, and they're in this movie too. Also disappointing because Ghost has the opportunity to be a very sympathetic character. As it stands, they don't hit it home as well as they probably thought they did. In fact, 2018 in general, Thanos and Killmonger. It looked like Marvel Studios was in the phase of learning from the past. Why it's a little disappointing now after those two movies and their villains, seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp do a bit of a back step in that department, and really there were too many irons in the fire in terms of villains or antagonists. One, you have Ghost, someone who can phase through matter because of the quantum realm coming after him. Then you have the FBI because Scott Lang is on house arrest and he's not actually supposed to be out there doing this stuff, but he is, and make them think that he's actually still at home. That's an added complication. Then you have Walton Goggins, who's a criminal, and he's coming after him too. That is the most out of place element in this movie. Why is Goggins in this movie? Why is there a band of criminals coming after him that they also have to dodge? I'll actually tell you the reason they're in it, because of the car chase scene sequences were only comprised of FBI agents, you couldn't do really destructive shit to get away from them. Like that scene right there, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that agent, is he, is he okay? Did he break his neck? Did does he have a family? He probably has a family, is he okay? He's just an agent doing his job. There's nothing wrong with that, he's not a villain. But you make him scumbags, yeah sure, break your neck, no one cares. And I feel like that's the only reason those criminals in particular were in this movie. I feel like they would have fit in the movie a little more if maybe they were tied in with Ghost or something. The mid credit sequence is a great one. The very last end credit scene is actually, it was in the trailer. The mid credit post credit sequences, I mean, those are sacred. Don't throw them into the trailer. I feel like it's not the first movie either. I feel like there's another movie, I can't think of it right now, but that happened. Guys, in the end, Ant Man and the Wasp, enjoyable movie. You see Easter eggs and some trickle from events that have happened in the MCU in the past, but really a lot of it's really tied with Hank Pym and his family. It's more personal. It really is Paul Rudd, Michael Douglas, and Evangeline Lilly. They're weird family dynamic just carries the movie. That and the action sequence superhero mechanics elevate this movie to a really enjoyable film. Makes you look past some of the flaws. One in particular where it kind of felt like a CW thing, where it was like, we don't have to have a good explanation for it, but this thing happens and you're like, I'm not really sold on the Evangeline Lily Paul Rudd romance, probably because I feel like most of it that built, built in between the two movies, they kind of talk about it, but we didn't see it. So when she's pissed at him, you don't really feel like he lost a girlfriend or anything. And she shows affection for him or she's flirting with him. It just kind of feels out of place. Like where'd that come from? I know in the first movie it was building a bit there, but I just, I just don't buy it. I like the first Ant-Man movie more than Ant-Man and the Wasp, but still had a really enjoyable time with this one. In fact, I had a really good time, no alcohol required. Funny little side note, on the thumbnail of my Ant-Man review, there's actually a little me on my shoulder. 
but I feel like the picture got so pixelated when you upload it to YouTube and then the thumbnail is so small, no one caught it. So it is what it is. All right, so Ant-Man and the Wasp, have you seen it? What did you think about it? Whatever you thought, comment below, let me know. And as always, if you like what you've seen here and you want to see more, click right here to see more.